Wow. Okay, stay standing. This is my favorite part. <laughs> um, today, who's going to be bringing lecture to you this week and minister to us is my friend, Michael Miller. I always hate to read bios, but I just love him so much. I got to give him, you got to know for you guys who don't know who he is, uh, Michael and his beautiful wife were the founder and senior leaders of Upper Room, the Upper Room Movement. They have affected and infected us so much. I mean, we feel like we're sister ministries. And so uh, April of 2010, Michael and his wife, Larissa, uh, started a small prayer meeting in an office space overlooking downtown Dallas. You got to hear him talk about that, by the way. And uh, from that initial prayer meeting, God birthed the movement of prayer and worship that continues to grow globally. And many lives have been impacted by Upper Room's House of Prayer as people online and from across the Dallas Metroplex come together to minister to the Lord. Come on, somebody. Let us minister to the Lord. Yeah. <clears throat> And so, of course, they travel extensively, extensively, and of course, you know, most of you know their music comes out. In fact, today, uh, Michael's brought with him um, the uh, Upper Room School of Ministry first year students. Yeah! We love you guys. Thanks for being with us. So, Christ for the Nations, would you give Michael Miller a warm welcome as he comes to bring us the Word of God. What's up? How's everybody? Yeah. Hey, well, my I brought I brought I typically teach our first year in this hour, and so I got in front of them about 30 minutes ago, and I said, "Let's go on a field trip." And uh, so they are here with me. Would you guys stand up really quickly? Look at all of them, beauties. So what's up? Glad you came. Uh, thank you. Love you. I'm gonna have them, they're gonna be my ministry team, so we're gonna to minister to one another um, at 11.45. So at 11.45, would you just raise your hand? Yep, just like that. You're my timer. So I know at 11.45, we're gonna start praying. What's up? What's your name? Chad. Chad, all right, Chad, that's perfect. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, open them to John 14. Uh, I am in the middle of what well, we just began last week, uh, the Upper Room Discourse, one of my favorite uh, teachings, one of my favorite sections of scripture, and I am just gonna teach what I would be teaching them here. So we're gonna walk through John 14, 15, 16 over the next two days. I'll be here, uh, I'm obviously here now, I'll be here tomorrow, and then my wife will be here Thursday morning. And uh, we are just ecstatic. We love CF&I. You guys are our extended family. I love Pastor Adam and Golan and Kiplin and the leadership here at CFNI. There's such a rich history and there is such an amazing future for CFNI and what God has in store and it is just awesome uh, to be a part of it. Um, I get to teach here often and so um, it is just uh, a, a dear reward of mine and I get to play golf with Adam McCain occasionally. How many times have we played? Have we? <laughs> <laughs> I remember. It was awesome. Uh, we played with J. Lou. J. Lou's uh, here. And then that song, Fire and Wind, Come and Do It Again, Open Up the Gates, Let Heaven On In. Do you know who wrote that? A CFNI student, Alyssa Smith. Uh, Alyssa is uh, a dear, dear friend of mine, and uh, she's one of the worship leaders at Upper Room. But I love her story because she sat in this room, and for years, she didn't make the worship team at CFNI. For years. She would try out, and they would say, no. For whatever reason, you don't make it year after year after year. And so she showed up to Upper Room not really thinking or seeing herself as a worship leader, which is kind of crazy to think now that she's been writing, uh, I mean, she's written a number of songs um, and is really known internationally as a worship leader, and she is the fruit of this soil. See if and I is good soil. Bury your life here and watch what God does, but know that there's, he's doing something that isn't about this season. It's about the seasons ahead, but you giving yourself over to the soil is so crucial. 
Uh, there's, there's places in the Lord, uh, that, there's places in his heart that he wants to reveal to you in the hiddenness of uh, these years at CFNI. And so, man, fully give yourself over to the Lord and watch what he does in you in order to do something through you. But he's got to do it in you first. And so that's what this soil is about. Amen and amen. All right, John 14. You guys ready? Uh, this favorite section of scripture for me because uh, it's all Jesus' words. It's Jesus' final words to his disciples. And when my wife and I planted the upper room in Oak Lawn, which as the crow flies is probably five-ish, maybe less than 10 miles in downtown homosexual district of our city. It's a church planting graveyard. God called us to start a prayer meeting there. It was called the upper room because the business owner who allowed us to pray uh, in his building, he called the room the upper room. It was above a veterinarian clinic. Uh, he, was a, he was actually a, a, a vet, and he really had a heart for Oak Lawn, and he said, would you guys uh, come here and pray? And so we started praying, and, uh, and no one was coming. So no one was showing up. Uh, weekends we had services and no one was there and the Lord spoke to me said son I first didn't call you down here to minister to people I called you down here to minister to me and that really reframed my view and perspective of ministry that my ministry first was creating a resting place in Oak Lawn for the Lord and we did that through morning noon and night prayer and uh, <clears throat> and in that process I had a lot of time on my hands and so I would, since this room was called the upper room, what I started doing is reading the upper room discourse. It's Jesus' final words. If you have a red letter Bible, raise your hand. Okay, these three chapters are all red. They're all red. It's the reddest part of your Bible because it is Jesus' final words to his disciples. And when I was reading this over and over and over and over, I saw a thread throughout these chapters that Jesus is instructing his disciples uh, about what's to come. And his disciples have no idea what he's talking about. As Jesus begins talking, the disciples get extremely confused. And their hearts actually shut down as Jesus is talking. They shut down. They shut down. They, they end up in utter disbelief because of these words. And I'll show you that process tomorrow. Usually I start out by showing you the process. Uh, but today, since my, my team over here is uh, this is week two of the Upper Room Discourse, so this is part two. Tomorrow will be part one, but it won't matter. You'll get the whole enchilada. But he starts out here in John chapter uh, 14, verse one. It, it's, kind of the, it's kind of the thesis for the Upper Room Discourse, and it's the first verse. John, Jesus tells his disciples, he says this, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Do not let your hearts be troubled, Believe in God, believe also in me. So I see, I see this verse as an umbrella. And the upper room discourse fits under John 14, verse 1. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And he is going to instruct the disciples about what's about to happen. And as he's talking, and I'll show you this tomorrow, their hearts are going to be extremely troubled. Because they weren't prepared to face what they were about to go through. And man, in, in, if, if I could teach my kids one lesson... <clears throat> One lesson, it would be this. It would be how to steward their hearts through trial and trouble. Like you, you I, I, was, I was reflecting on this the other day. Uh, I, I've got a four-year bachelor degree from Abilene Christian. I went out there to play baseball. Um, I was a business major. I didn't really know the Lord. And I look back at my education, and most of my education in business school is irrelevant to me today. I was marketing management. I took like marketing research, digital marketing, all the business lingo terms, things. I spent hours studying business and I'm using none of that today because I'm in full-time ministry. But there's one course that I took in 1997, Adam. You'll like this, 1997. I just aged myself. I was a sophomore in West Texas and you have to do two electives uh, that would be like sports classes. You know, and, and, and so you have options. You can do like basketball, you can do football, you can do different things that... They would consider electives. Well, do you know what I took in 1997? It was as if I was living in 2023 when I took this course. You ready? I took pickleball. Come on. I took pickleball in 1997. No one had heard of pickleball. 
But man, I became a master of pickleball in 1997. And this last weekend, my wife's birthday, we were celebrating it. And you know what she wanted to do? Because she started playing pickleball. She wanted to go to Chicken and Pickle in Grand Prairie. I'd never been to Chicken and Pickle, but it's 77,000 square feet. They've got about a dozen pickleball courts. And guess what? I held court there. Anyone that got on that thing, I was just like, they're like, how are you this good? I was like, because I've been playing this since 1997. I got a degree in pickleball, yo. <laughs> I know about the kitchen. I knew about scoring. It was just like a duck in water. I just started like moving a fish in water, let's say, not a duck in water, a fish in water. It was so natural for me to get on that pickleball court and impress everyone. My wife fell in love with me again. <laughs> Right there, right there. Because I was just, shh, put some spin on the balls and people were like, what is this guy doing? 1997, Abilene Christian, pickleball champ, man, that was me. So what's my point? My point is I'm thankful that I took a course in college that was practical for me today. And over the next two days, I don't wanna just give you theology. I think theology is important and you need theology. I don't want to give you practical ways to do ministry, be effective, be influential, like all that's awesome and there's a place for it. But listen, if you do not have what I am going to uh, hopefully equip you with over the next two days, this is a big statement, all of that is irrelevant. Because Jesus is telling his disciples, don't let your heart be troubled. What's your heart? From your heart flow the issues of your life. Your heart is central to who you are. And if your heart is wonky, your life is wonky. Your heart, like 2 Corinthians 4, 6, Jesus, Paul says that when you met the Lord, he who spoke light into darkness shone the light of the knowledge of his glory, which is the face of Christ in your heart. Your heart once was deceitfully wicked, but when you got born again, you got a new heart, and Jesus said, that is going to be my home. I want to live there. Meaning, the issues that your heart faces, his face is right there. In light of all that you face, he wants those things to meet his face. That's this real estate. He paid a lofty price for that. His blood and his body purchased your heart. And he says, that's my home. And he wants that heart to be whole, wholeheartedness, a heart that's liberated from circumstances, from feelings, from what it's been through. When you bring and present a heart before the Lord that has been made whole because of his blood, in light of what you've been through, I believe it's one of the greatest acts of worship that we can bring to him. And listen to me, you 20-somethings, you have a lot of life ahead of you. A lot of life. And guess what? Life is going to throw you a curveball. It's not a matter of if storms come, it is when. And storms don't come to test the man. They come to test what the man has built. They test the house. And I want to applaud you for giving the years of your youth into a soil like CFNI and what God's going to cultivate into your heart. I want, I want to applaud you. But you can have a head filled with knowledge, theology, practical skills. You can have an Instagram following. You can, have, uh, uh, you can be an artist or a preacher. And yet if your heart is wonky, you will be miserable. And yet you can have none of that. And if your heart is whole, you've got everything. Listen, in, 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 uh, this is a fascinating story, Pastor McCain. I, in August 20th of 2018, I believe it was opening day in this room. And Golan gave me the honor and privilege to preach that morning to the student body. It was amazing. God showed up. He had like the flags, right? This is my first time experience. I was like, oh my goodness, the room was packed. God showed up, I walked off the stage, right where you were was my backpack, I got my phone out, and I had 22 missed calls, 22 missed calls from uh, uh, a guy named Taylor. Taylor is the oldest, he's probably 24, oldest child of seven, and his dad is a spiritual father, mentor, elder in our community, staple, like if you 
came to the upper room from 2018 back, you knew who Taylor's dad was. His name was Terry. Terry had a gray helmet of hair. He had a mustache, about 6'6". Six, six. He stood out, and if you came to the upper room, he hugged everybody. 22 missed calls after I walk off this stage, and it's, it's Taylor, and I'm like, you guys are all fired up, excited. We just, the glory of God. I'm like, Taylor, you called me 22 times. Is my dad is dead on the living room floor. I said, your, your dad? Yes, Terry, he, he didn't wake up. He didn't wake up from his sleep. I said, who's there at the house? He said, all my siblings and my mom, can you come out here? I look at my wife. I said, honey, Terry's dead. She said, what? Get in the car, we start calling people. 45 minute drive out to Terrell's where he lived. So up the corners taking his body out. I walk into the living room and there's a family, a widow and now seven kids that don't have a father. That's an intense story. Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. I, one of the themes here, hear me, one of the themes in the Old Testament, throughout the Psalms, you hear this phrase, the day of trouble, the day of trouble. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what the day of trouble looks like for you, but that day, August 20th of 2018, is a day I will never forget. That's a day of trouble. Or when I was 13, 12 or 13, Sixth grade going into seventh. My, my best friend, who I played sports with, my best friend who, who I was staying at his house, which I did regularly, I wake up, and you know what? Something had happened to him by an older adult. He had touched him in ways that he shouldn't have touched him. And guess what? He's attempting to touch me in the same way. And that night, I got to introduce to my sexuality. I'm... I'm 46 years old. I'm still waiting for my dad to give me the talk. <laughs> I got four kids, so I figured something out. But my point is that my point is that is that no one taught me about my sexuality. My sexuality was introduced to me by a friend who had had things done to him. And listen, I got up in the middle of the night and I left that house. But what happened in that moment marked my heart. I didn't know what to do with it. I, it was a day of trouble in my life. I would live from that experience and enter into a season of sexual brokenness. Part of my story is how God has restored my sexuality. I am healthily married to my hot wife. She's amazing. I'm super stoked. It's like, gosh, man, that part of you, though, was designed for covenant. And it was designed for covenant with, with someone of the opposite sex, and it's nuclear, though, and, and, and used the wrong way, it can destroy a lot. And for years, it destroyed my heart and my life because I didn't know what to do with that moment, that day of trouble. I, I can walk through other uh, seasons and times where, where man, there's a 24-hour period where trouble hit. And, and the disciples are about to walk through a day of trouble, and Jesus is going to lay breadcrumbs out. Throughout this conversation, he's going to lay breadcrumbs, and they have no idea what he's saying, but we, looking back retrospectively, can see the breadcrumbs that he was laying out for them so that in spite of what they were walking through, they could have a whole heart. But if you don't deal with the day of trouble, a 24-hour period, a day where life throws a curveball at you where, where disappointment hits, where unmet expectations. If you don't process that rightly, a day turns into a week, a week turns into a month, a month turns into months. Months equals years, years can equal a lifetime because you never fully dealt with that day. You live in response to it. 
And the beauty of the gospel is that there is a historical fact. There's a 24-hour period where Jesus faced all that you will face. And he says, listen, if you, will, if you will bring those issues in your heart to what I have accomplished for you, I will empower your heart to live supernaturally through the trouble. And on the other side of it, you'll have a knowledge of me. You'll have a confidence and a faith and a history that only I can give you. And so it's, trouble is actually an opportunity for us to encounter the Lord, but we need the right tools to handle those things. So tomorrow, I will show you the process. Their hearts go from trouble to fear, fear to sorrow, sorrow to temptation, temptation to sleep. Sleep is unbelief, and they are shut down and they abandon the Lord. These are the fathers of the early church. And then their, their hearts were healed in a moment. And I'll show you that moment tomorrow. But for today, I want to just walk you through two questions trouble presents. And then I'm going to give you the solution after I present the two issues. Ready? So do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Verse 2. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Now, one of the themes in the Upper Room Discourse is Jesus telling his disciples he's going somewhere. So I circle in my Bible, if, uh, for I go, in verse 2, for I go to prepare a place for you. Verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. Now, he's speaking about his departure to be with, with his father, and he knows what's ahead, but his disciples don't. So Thomas asked the obvious question. What's the obvious question? If you go, Lord, we don't know the way. <laughs> Where are you going? And Jesus answers with such a surety and clarity and certainty. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. <laughs> we love that scripture. But you need to know that that didn't make sense to Thomas at the time. Thomas thinks Jesus is actually going to a place to prepare a home for them to live with him. Lord, I, I want to make sure I got this. Show me the way. Now, here's question number one. The disciples asked two questions right out of the gates. Question number one this is when trouble comes to your heart, this is trouble forces you to face this question Lord, where are you? Lord, where are you? Everyone follow me? First question Lord, where are you? Jesus says, Well, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father from me. And then verse 7, he says, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Uh, what? If you know me, you know my father also. From now on, you know him. Know who? Know the father. How do we know the father? Because you've known me. Wait, you have a father that we have not met, but you're saying if we know you, we know the father. So Philip asked the obvious question. Verse 8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it will be enough for us. What was Philip saying? Show us the Father so that we can know who he is. Jesus is saying, wait, if you've seen me, you've seen him, but they haven't seen him. Am I right? What's my point? Another question, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. What is Philip asking? Lord, what is, what is the Father actually like? What, what, what is he like? What is his nature? And Jesus is, is really taken back. He's actually going to rebuke him in verse 9. He's like, have I been with you so long that you have not come to know me? Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? But in essence, what Philip is saying, what is your Father like? And hear me, these are the two overarching questions that shadow the day of trouble. Where are you, God, and what are you like? Lord, if you were with me, this wouldn't have happened. Lord, if you're good then why do I walk off this stage and have 22 missed calls from a 24-year-old who's the oldest of seven kids? Where were you? This doesn't seem like you're good. This doesn't seem like you're faithful. 
Oh, you're the resurrection and the life. Like, these are, these are real questions. I can do one of two things. I can do one of two things. I can create some weird theology about his goodness. Well, this is a part of his goodness, brother. Or I can just put band-aids over it. He's still faithful. <laughs> God bless you, brother. <laughs> but inside, I am so walled up, shut down, in pain, in hurt. And I just kind of grip my teeth and... <laughs> That doesn't work. This is how your heart gets wonky. Are, are you with me? Yeah. Where are you? What do you like? Now, the just walk by what? Faith. So we don't walk by circumstance, we walk by faith. And, <clears throat> you know, the day of trouble reveals how you've built in the previous days. And you want to build in faith. What do you want to build in faith with? You want to build in faith and knowing where he's at. You want to build in faith what the Bible describes about who he is, the nature of God and the supremacy. Right? I mean, I, we, can, we can hone in on that. I think that's why worship's been so prevalent in our world is because worship's agreeing with who he is. Everyone say worship is agreeing with who he is. So when I'm singing a song about his holiness, uh, let me sing about his faithfulness. Faithful, you are faithful. True, you're always true. How many of you know that song? You'll never leave me, you're always with me, you're good. So this is a song ascribing unto him who he is. And these songs of worship, again, not every song we sing is worship. Worship's agreeing with who he is, but they, 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 they create an edifice of sorts in our hearts in the knowledge of who he is. You following me? Worship agreeing with who he is. But, but trouble comes to test those moments. Trouble comes to test what we've placed and built within our hearts around the knowledge of him. And there it goes from just being a theology to a life source, to a lifeline. And, and what I've learned in the day of trouble is that the Lord, the Lord has met me. I, I can tell you, I'll tell you at the end how the Lord met me in that day. Uh, I, could, I could share probably about a dozen stories of, of, of trouble personally and now I've been teaching on this a while. I've seen collectively within people that, that I'm leading when the day of trouble comes, their response that the Lord meets them with a word. The Lord meets them in a moment with a verse. The Lord meets them in a moment. I just feel like the Lord is so committed to meeting us in the hour of trouble. It doesn't mean that there's not a process to walk through, and we're going to see the process the disciples walk through tomorrow, but what it does is it establishes your heart in him to navigate and walk through it. So, Jesus is going to continue. If you're with me, say amen. Yeah. <laughs> like, getting, so yes. All right, verse 10. <laughs> verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? Now, now listen to this. Connect that. <clears throat> Do you not believe? What was verse 14? 14, uh, chapter 14, one, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. So there's something about belief in our hearts. So verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his work. <coughs> verse 11, believe me. Everyone say, believe me. believe me. That I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe in the works themselves. Truly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. <coughs> Everyone say, he will. he will. He will do also. And greater works than these, everyone say, he will. he will. He will do because I go to the Father. So Jesus is connecting this. Connect the narrative. I'm going away. Where are you going? Well, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Show us the Father. I am him. Okay. Where are you going? What do you like? Just believe in these things. And what happens when you believe? When you believe, you will do greater things. And so 
we love this verse. We love verse 12, like, you know, the greater works, I can do the greater things, but it's connected to the following text. Look at verse 13. He's gonna enter into prayer now. I'm gonna talk about prayer. He says, whatever you ask in my name, whatever you ask in my name, so whatever, this is prayer. Whatever you ask in my name, that, everyone say, will I. That will I do so that the Father in me may be glorified in the Son. So whatever you, disciple, ask in Jesus' name, that Jesus will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will. Everyone say, I will. I will do it. So the previous verses are, you will do greater things, but if you ask me, I will do whatever you ask. Now, these are, these are like lofty promises, all right? So this says, this says, whatever you ask in my name, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now, how, how many in this room have asked whatever to the Lord? Now, keep your hands raised. How many of you in your whatever, you feel like, Lord, I'm not certain you answered that prayer? Okay, every hand should probably be up in the room if you've walked with the Lord for any amount of time. He says, whatever you ask, I'll do it. If you ask anything, I'll do it. Now, whatever and anything pretty much cover all things. Am I right? <laughs> I mean, you're whatever or you're anything. This is about you conversing with the Lord, and the promise is, I will do it. Now, now beloved, young person, what is he talking about? Because if you, if, you, if you don't know what he's talking about, when you bring your whatever, especially in the day of trouble, and you don't connect this to what he's actually saying, you're gonna look at this as a coffee mug scripture and like, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> anything. <laughs> I'm not certain that's true. It's like, you're like, here's my whatever. And you're like, whatever. Whatever. CF and I. You guys are just holding the pep rally for Jesus. This pep rally for Jesus doesn't sustain when the rubber meets the road. Why? Because we've just been, hey, 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 whatever you ask, brother. You ask anything. And, and, and we end up insulating our hearts. We shut our hearts down because we read promises like that and we're like, it's not true. Why? Because life will throw you a curveball. Listen, the promise isn't influence. Don't go after influence. Don't go after being a leader for Jesus. Be a disciple. Be one that knows him. Be one that's tethered to him. Be one that knows his voice. You're not out to do something great for Jesus. He's already done something great. It's just we have sold a generation about purpose and ah, and it's like, no, it's not about that. It's about knowing him. It's about your heart knowing him. Not, it's not about your whatever. It's not about your anything. But what he's saying is in your whatever, in your anything, I will do something. But I won't do exactly what you think I'm going to do. I'm going to do something. And he's going to show you what he's going to do. But it's not that he's going to do your whatever or do your anything. And if you think that he's here to serve your whatever, your anything, you're going to end up in disappointment. You're going to end up like with a fractured view of who he is because you've been sold a bill of good that it's about him doing something for you instead of you knowing him. It's about knowing Jesus. It's about knowing Jesus. This whole thing is about knowing Jesus and it's about making him known through your knowledge of him. But in trouble and in trial and in hardship and in fire and in the things that you bring to the Lord, there's an invitation for you to know him in those things. I feel the Holy Ghost. Whatever 
You said you would do it. Look at verse 15. If you love me, you will. Okay, I will. I will. You're whatever you're in. I will, but you will what? Obey my commandments. Now, he ain't putting you under the law. This isn't about, this isn't about the Ten Commandments. Okay? Follow me. You've got to read it in context. So this is an important, it seems like this verse is out of place. It's like, why did you insert that? I'm talking about obeying the commandments. What's, what's the commandments? Well, everything makes sense when you see where Jesus is taking his disciples. He starts them out. Hey, don't let your hearts be troubled. Who's the father? If you've seen me, you've seen him. And hey, by the way, you're going to do amazing things. Why? Because when you ask me, I'm going to do it. What are you going to do? Just obey me. Just obey me. Okay, but what are you talking about? <laughs> it's, it's verse 16. He's introducing He's introducing someone to them. Look at this. Verse 16, I will. Everyone say, I will. I will. What did Jesus say? In your whatever or in your anything, I will do it. But you obey me. And then here, verse 16 is what he will do in your anything and in your whatever. Look at this. I will ask the Father. He will give you another helper. They may be with you forever. Who's the helper? Holy Ghost. What does the Holy Ghost help you with? Your anything or your whatever. What does he say? In your anything, in your whatever, obey who? Holy Ghost. Why? Where the Spirit of the Lord is. Because he wants you to be liberated. From what? You're whatever, you're anything. I will give you a helper. He introduces the Holy Spirit here. And he doesn't say it. He says him. He introduces a personal relationship with someone else that will be in you and with you. This is the Holy Ghost. What is he going to help you with? You're whatever. What is he going to help you with? You're anything. Now, here's the thing about the Holy Spirit is oftentimes his leadership is not in a straight line. Like, Lord, here's my whatever. You want to, I can give you about a dozen of these, but because my boy Chad's about to raise his hand, I want to get to ministry. I don't know how many of you need a breakthrough financially, but <laughs> you're like, me, me I, um, yeah, yeah, that's me, right? <laughs> Right here. That's, that's a whatever for me. Um, so, hey, I, I just launched the upper room. I'm going to make this really quick. I want to just show you how the lordship of the spirit works. And, I, again, I could tell you a dozen of these, but I had an anything, and it was a big one. My wife was pregnant, and uh, our first child, and we were broke because we just planted the upper room. I was supposed to be selling insurance, and I wasn't selling much insurance because I was, you know, praying. And we had our bank accounts were red, and it's just a, it, was a, it was a rough season for us. And I'm like, Lord, I need $4,000 for uh, the birth of my child. And, uh, and so I was praying about it, and I felt like I was to sell my forerunner. I had a forerunner. And, uh, and so I was going to sell it. It was worth four grand. I paid for my baby. And so I'm sitting with the Lord, and I'm like, Lord, I'm going to sell this. And I felt like the Lord said, don't sell it. I want you to give it away. I'm like, Lord, if you think I'm going to give this away, uh, you're going to have to tell my wife. And so my wife comes to me like 24 hours later. I, I'm married. Like my wife has a T1 line to the Lord. Like she is like in, you know, like, hey, baby, I was just talking to the Lord. And uh, she said, to, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> we're to give away our car. And I'm like, okay, well, I was hoping he would tell you that too. But um, um, I, I was like, I, I just, let, let me ask again. Lord, are you sure you want me to give away the car? Like this is the only way I'm going to be paid. And so I'm like, honey, let's, let's pray again and see if we get the same person. 
And so we both pray, come back, and I like write someone's name down. Of course, my wife comes back. She goes, I think it should be this person. His name's Jonathan. And I'm like, that's who I thought too. And okay, let's give away our car. But I don't know how we're going to pay for this baby. And so I talked to Jonathan. Jonathan was traveling with an itinerant guy at the time. And he, I said, hey, man, I think we're supposed to give, us, give this car to you. And he's like, oh, man, I've been wanting a car. He's from England. And He's like, but I'm traveling, and so I'll get it when I get back. He was gone for six weeks. And, uh, and it's getting closer to the birth of our child. She was born in September. This is August. And, uh, and I'm like, maybe he forgot about the car. I'm just going to sell it. We were obedient. We offered it to him. He's been gone. We're just going to sell it. And I'm like, I'm like waffling. Well, he calls me up one day, and he goes, hey, can I come get that car? And I was like, oh, you remembered. I said, yeah, I remembered. You said you'd give it to me. And so I was like, okay, come on up to the upper room. So he comes up to the upper room, and I give him the keys, and, and he's like driving away. And I'm like, that's how I'm going to pay for the birth of our child. <laughs> and, uh, and my wife is so pregnant, and then he's gone, and I'm at the upper room. <laughs> I'm at the upper room, and I'm like, I realize now I don't have a way to get home because I gave him my car, so I have to walk home. And I'm like, Lord, this makes no sense, man. I, I genuinely, I don't have any money. I, I, we don't have enough money to buy food, like much less a birth of our child. And I, that was my plan. And so I walk in and my wife's, how are you? I'm like, well, I don't have a car anymore. And she's like, well, okay, well, yay. You know, my wife's just, she handles her whatever is different. So I'm like, okay. And she goes, hey, we have a dinner to get to like now. And I was like, really? She goes, yeah, there's a couple from the upper room. They just started, and I, I booked it, and I didn't know we were going to dinner. So we, we hop in the, her car, and we go to dinner with this couple. Um, hadn't been to dinner with them since that time. Never met them before. We sit down. We're having a nice dinner. It's great. How you doing? Doing great. I'm thinking about my car. I'm thinking about the baby. I'm thinking about all these things. They're just talking, but they don't know anything. The end of the dinner, as they're serving dessert, I'm at the end of the table with this husband, and he like looks at me, and he goes, hey, can I ask you a question? I was like, yeah. He goes, tell me about your finances. And I was like, what do you want to know? And he goes, well, how are you doing? And I was like, I'm doing good. And he goes, well, what about insurance? Do you have insurance? And I was like, uh, we had like a med share deal. And I was like, yeah, we've got insurance. Well, how are you going to pay for the baby? Um, I, not certain. How much is the baby? 4000 you have? He starts drilling in. And finally, I just like, I don't have enough money. And he's like, okay, I felt like I was supposed to ask. And... Um, and so dinner served, we're leaving, he walks up, he hands me an envelope. We get in the car, I open the envelope, and inside the envelope, I'd given away my car five hours prior. Inside that envelope was $14,000. not cool? That was awesome. So, so now that was a whatever or anything, and God showed up really, really quickly. Like, uh, that's... Sometimes I think stories like that can be the standard, like, well, God must do that for me. No, the standard is following his help. The standard is being obedient to his help. And now I know the Lord as a provider. There's a series of things that he did, but in that season where we had nothing, I began to realize I have everything. Why? Because he's committed to my whatever or anything to send me help, to send me help, to send me help from on high, who's with me and in me no matter what. It's just being obedient to that voice inside of me. And so here's what I want to do. Tomorrow, I'm going to walk you through. The disciples get wonky in this. They don't understand what I just said, but, but this whatever, anything, they go through a significant trial, and I'm going to show you what happens to their heart, and it happens to all of our hearts if we don't process trouble rightly. I'll show you the process that they went through and when their hearts got whole after the resurrection. It is such a cool Revelation. I feel like it's like the Da Vinci Code. I crack something in the Upper Room Discourse. But it centers around this, dealing rightly with trouble. Dealing rightly with trouble. So here's what I want. I'm going to invite my students up here. I'm going to have you line up if you guys would come and line up. Can my, oh, you're on the, yeah, you got me. Can we pray for you? Okay, you guys come line up here. I want them to line up. And hey, I want you to think about your whatever, anything. And here's how the Holy Spirit works. He works two ways. Holy Spirit could come directly to you and speak to you. But one of the things Holy Spirit loves to do is he loves to speak to us through other people. He loves to rest in one and move through that one 
to bless another. We're the body. So you guys can just line up all the way through. Keep going, keep going. And here's what I want you to do. I'm gonna say, y'all wanna stand up? And if you need prayer in in anything or whatever, I want you to come and receive that. Men with men, ladies with ladies. Pass to Adam. I need it. All right, you guys can come forward. Jesus, I pray that you blast students, that you bless students, that you meet students in their anything, in their whatever. We just want to partner with you, Holy Spirit. Partner with you, Holy Spirit. You, there's room up here. There's some ladies up here. Some guys on the side. You guys scoot down. Nuri, scoot down that way. Nuri's over here. Raise your hand if you're a student and you have, you're a USM student and you have freedom. There's some people over here. You're willing to pray. All right. So as these guys are coming forward, I want to pray for you out there, though. Would you just raise your hands before the Lord? And Father, I pray, just bring your whatever or anything. Like, itemize it. Lord, I'm bringing this before you right now. I'm bringing an affliction. I'm bringing something, Lord, that I, it's just unresolved in my heart. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you, you, from the throne room of heaven, would descend into hearts. And that you would speak, Father, very clearly. That you would direct that you would be the spirit of truth, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of power, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, that you would fall upon hearts and you would give them insight to your heart. You would give them insight, Lord, to your ability to lead them through their whatever, through their anything. Father, would you feed them fresh bread today? Fresh bread, Lord, daily bread for their anything, for their whatever. That, Lord, you've gotten them this far, and, Lord, you're committed to the journey. You're committed to the story, and that you would author fresh faith in their hearts right now. I pray for substance from the Holy Spirit to fill your heart, that it would fill your heart, that any sorrow, any grief, any despair, any hopelessness would be evicted from your heart right now in Jesus' name. We declare the lordship of the Spirit over every heart, over every circumstance. Come, Lord Jesus. We enthrone you upon our whatever. We enthrone you upon our anything. So if you're praying about a whatever anything, just listen for 30 seconds. Holy Spirit instruct. Holy Spirit guide. If you love me, obey the guidance of my helper. So come, Holy Spirit, and help. Come, Holy Spirit, and empower. I pray in the name of Jesus.
Continue just ministering. The upper room guys are here. Just, just pray with anybody who wants to. They've got a few extra minutes. But, uh, but we want to be faithful to our time frame. It's straight up noon. I know many of you have to get to jobs. You've got uh, lunch that you've got to get to. So you can just quietly start dismissing yourself. The rest of it, if you want to wait for someone to pray with you, they're going to stay for a few more minutes. But just kind of quietly edge your way on out. And uh, tonight is Tuesday night experience we'll see you here at 7 p.m don't forget about that as well as the vocal auditions for being a part of the worship team 1 30 today in the wayne myers amen what about just a cd worship so these guys can yeah 